In a civilized country, the one thing you're absolutely not allowed to do is get creepy with other people's kids. That is not allowed. It's the worst thing. And even now, go ahead and try that in a place where the people have self-respect, like Africa or Eastern Europe. You will get killed and you will absolutely deserve it. But in this country, where the population has been instructed for decades to hate itself, there is very little resistance, if you think about it, to organized attempts to get sexually creepy with your kids, porn in school libraries, drag queen story hours, Rachel Levine, the fake admiral posing as a girl, encouraging your boys to, quote, switch genders. It's absolutely everywhere, despite their attempts to tell you that it's not. Of course it is. Look around. Well, Robbie Starbuck has noticed he's just directed a movie about all of this called The War on Children, which is exactly what it is. Here's a clip from the film. If you watch the news, you've probably heard politicians and pundits saying things like this. Transgender children are not having surgeries. That's really important to say. In his tweet, he talked about stopping surgeries for people under 18, which is not a thing. That is not a thing that happened. There is misinformation presented that somehow that we're doing surgery on minors or even children, and that simply is not true. So, Layla Jane, how old were you when they gave you a double mastectomy? It was a month after my 13th birthday. How long was the process before that with the doctors to, to prepare you for this? I initially started seeing doctors for my gender dysphoria um, when I was 12. So it was within that time frame, um, within a year. What age were you when they put you on puberty blockers? I was 12 years old. 12 years old, doctors gave you a drug called Lupron. This drug has been used to chemically castrate sex offenders, pedophiles in prison but they prescribed it to you to stop your hormones. Is that correct? Correct. Again, a healthy society protects its children. That's the whole point of having a society. That's why we have civilization. Otherwise, we just let young men do whatever they want or the people with guns rule over the rest of us. But we don't do that because we want to protect our children. And when a society ceases to make that a priority, that society ceases to exist. So this is a fight worth having. Robbie Starbuck has joined it in earnest, and we are grateful to have him join us now. Robbie, thanks so much for coming on. Um, so since you've been marinating in this topic, both on a kind of granular level and high level, uh, what's, what's, your, what's your top line conclusion about the attempt to sexualize our kids? Like, what is this exactly? This is a near planetary scale psychological operation to usher in a new form of communism. And I know to some people that might sound extreme, but, no. you know, to give a little insight, my family came from Cuba where communism happened in a flash. And I don't think a lot of Americans realize just how quickly this can happen. And we're well down the path. I would call it probable at this point. You know, we're fighting and we're fighting as hard as we can to make sure that it doesn't happen. But when the opposition party that is, you know, the quote ruling class owns every cultural institution and, you know, you've essentially got children locked into their indoctrination centers for more time than they spend with their parents or their religious leaders, you know, the outcome is truly horrific. You know, what we just watched with Layla Jane the way I was raised, it would have been considered barbarism and the appropriate result would have been the death penalty for any adults involved in the mutilation of the child. But we veered into this territory where people are sleepwalking and that's why we made this film because really truly adults in America needed to be shaken awake. Why would you allow your own children to be destroyed and mutilated? What's the thinking, do you think? Well, in this mass psychological operation, a lot of it has actually played out in a way where it's influenced the parents as well to believe that there's something wrong with them if they question this, that, you know, they're, they're some kind of, you know, ideologue that's insane if they are not okay with their child suddenly deciding they're a different gender. And, you know, on, on the flip side of this, you've also got states like California, where we highlight in the film this child named Jaylee, where her mom refused to transition her. So you've got these parents who do step up. And what does the state do? They crush them. She had her child stolen from her. And then in state care, Jaylee ended up committing suicide. So when another parent sees that and they see that the state will take action against you if you oppose it, if you live in one of those states, and you're trapped in some job and you feel like you can't leave, a lot of them feel like there's no other option but to go along with it. And sadly, you know, we've got to build up a culture that really defends these children and produces parents who are brave enough to be warriors for these kids. 
And and I think warrior is the word. I mean, if you if you can't use force in defense of your own children, then obviously you know, you're not free and your children don't belong to you. My whole life I've heard politicians say, this is the most important election in history. And it's always bullshit. But in this case, it genuinely is true. This is the breaking point. You don't save the next generation right now. They will become the future voters and the future leaders of tomorrow. And they will be fully indoctrinated into this cult. This is a cult. This ideology will break this country and everything our founders and ancestors built. Okay, and, and that's not just this country. That's goodness. That's virtues. It's about humanity. What is inside of us? What are we willing to do to tell the difference between right and wrong and to stand and really stand for something as a human being? Because we're lacking that. Our soul is tattered right now, not just as a country but is the human race. That's why I said this is an almost planetary scale operation. And you yeah. see it all over the West. You see it in the permissiveness of immigration. You see it in the permissiveness of sexualizing our kids. We're at sort of an end stage now. This has been going on for a long time and you tied it to immigration, I think correctly. And maybe the thing those this topic and immigration have in common is that we're unable to defend ourselves from invasion or from sex crimes being perpetrated against our kids. These are sex crimes against our kids. And no one, our self-defense mechanism seems to have been disabled as a society and as individuals. How did that happen? Thanks a lot for watching us on X. There is a lot more to see and you can find it on tuckercarlson.com. We hope you'll join us. Among the many thousands of Americans who came to the Capitol building on January 6th, 2021, were an awful lot of journalists, working journalists. And they were there because among other things, it was a news story in progress. So they went to what we call cover the story. And the overwhelming majority of them worked for various organs of state media, the Associated Press, Reuters, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NBC News. And their job was to bolster whatever the people in charge claim is true. But there were also some independent journalists there that day. One of them was called Steve Baker. He now works for The Blaze. And he was there for the same reason everyone else is there, to watch the protest play out and to cover it. And like so many reporters that day, he eventually moved with the crowd inside the Capitol building, and he did so peacefully to cover the story. We're not guessing about this. He did not show up to break windows or poke anyone with a flagpole. He was there to cover it as a journalist. And we have footage of it, of Baker in the Capitol. We're going to put it up now. You can see he's not rioting or attacking police. He's standing there watching what's happening around him covering the story. But because Steve Baker wasn't wise enough to get a job with the Washington Post or the New York Times or any other news outlet that works for the Biden administration, the FBI singled him out, not as a reporter, which he is, but as an insurrectionist. And then they charged him with crimes for being there. The charges include disruptive conduct and restricted building, parading, demonstrating, or picketing in the Capitol building. And they meant it. They weren't joking. And by the way, no one defended Steve Baker. None of the free press organizations that exist to defend working journalists stood up for him or said a word when Baker was arrested at the FBI office in Dallas. Here's video of Baker turning himself in. And as you can see, he was humiliated. They cuffed him behind his back, not because he posed a threat to anyone, but because they wanted to make the message crystal clear to everyone else. Only regime media will be treated as legitimate. Others will be crushed. Steve Baker joins us now to recount his experiences with the so-called justice system. Steve Baker, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, um, so thanks, when last, Tucker, for having me. Of course. When last we spoke about a year ago, um, there mm -hmm. were hints this was coming. I'll just speak for myself as a middle-aged American man. I didn't really believe that they could arrest a journalist for covering a story. They did ultimately, as we just showed, arrest you. Mm -hmm. Were you as shocked as I was? Probably not as shocked because I had been dealing with this for about two and a half years. I had initially had a threat of prosecution going all the way back to November of 21 when my attorney received a email from an assistant U.S. attorney out of Philadelphia in which she said, your client, meaning me, would is going to be arrested or is going to be charged within the week. And so after we did a bit of a, uh, a bit of a media pushback, kind of a, an offensive against that threat, then we didn't hear from them again for 20 months. Now, after 20 months, I was starting to feel pretty good about it. During that interim time, I actually spoke with you. And then 
uh, in August of last year, uh, we received a grand jury subpoena. My attorney calls me back, says, all right, we've got a grand jury subpoena for your work, your actual videos that you took on January 6th. We complied uh, yet again, and uh, then we didn't hear from them for another four months. Well, during this time, I'm now working for the Blaze, and so I was actually in D.C. As a matter of fact, I was sitting in uh, Representative Thomas Massey's office on December 14th, just this past uh, December, and I, uh, I get a text from my attorney, which is never a, a welcome thing, an unsolicited text from your attorney, which she said, I think this is the one, the big one. So I stepped out into the hallway there at the Rayburn building and called my attorney, and he said, well, they want you to self-surrender next week in my hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, the blaze went into high gear. We did another media offensive, had millions of views of this uh, the story that we were telling about me having to self-surrender, and they backed off yet again. They, we got another call the next day from the FBI saying that they were going to put that off until sometime after Christmas. Once again, we didn't hear from them for two months until two weeks ago, we got the notice that I was going to have to self-surrender this time, and this time it was for real. They actually said that it was only going to be for misdemeanor charges, the four basic misdemeanors that all the low-level January 6 offenders get. Uh, and because I happen to be working here in Dallas right now, uh, where Blaze is headquarters, we decided to go ahead and do my self-surrender here at the FBI field office. So they didn't raid me. They didn't come out to my hotel or to the Blaze Studios. Uh, we went down to the FBI field office and submitted myself. Uh, the interesting thing, Tucker, is that in the notice from the uh, assistant U.S. attorney to my my lead attorney is that they wanted me to show up at the field office, and I quote, wearing shorts, T-shirt, and flip-flops. And I knew what that meant. That meant that they were probably going to change me into the orange jumpsuit and that I would then be leg shackled. Because the plan was for the FBI to process me there at the, the field office, put me in a car, take me downtown to the courthouse where they would hand me over to the U.S. Marshals, and then I would wait in a cell until I was marched before the magistrate in front of the, um, uh, the, in front of the whole court. And so what ended up taking place is that uh, my attorney negotiated with the two FBI agents in advance of me surrendering. I did not have to get into an orange jumpsuit. I showed up with a jacket, tie, slacks, dress shoes. They made me take off my shoelaces, my belt, and my tie, and then hand my jacket over to my attorney. Uh, then they took me, they allowed me to wear my own shirt, my own trousers. Uh, they handcuffed me, fingerprinted me, marched me out to the car, which has been seen on camera. Took me, to the, took me to the courthouse, handed me over to the U.S. Marshals, and that's where they put the leg chains, the belt chain, belted my wrist, uh, or chained my wrist to my stomach, and then sat me in a jail cell with a meth dealer. It's hard to believe <clears throat> any of that's real. A couple of questions. One, what's the name of the uh, assistant U.S. attorney who did this? Adam Dreher out of D.C. Yeah, Adam Dreher, I, I hope becomes famous. It's not a threat, uh, but I think we deserve to know who is doing this. I mean, the state of Texas has more than a million uh, illegal invaders in it right now. Um, there are also an awful lot of murders in the state of Texas. And so this is what they're spending their time doing. I have to ask, did any of the FBI agents, we always hear that, you know, the line agents are good guys, did any of the U.S. Marshals say to you, you know, I'm embarrassed that I'm chaining you uh to, you know, chaining you to your own stomach on a misdemeanor charge for something that isn't actually a crime. Did anyone betray any acknowledgement that this is like all a farce? The, the two agents that processed me did not do that. I have received messages from retired whistleblowing yeah. uh, agents all over the country apologizing to me for the behavior of the uh, the once the agency they were once proud of, I will tell you that while they were patting me down and going through the process, uh, I did chat with them and I asked them point blank. I said, so how often do you do this to misdemeanor defendants? Uh, the first time there was a little bit of mumbling and then I kind of reiterated, I said, is this, is, is it, is it normal or do you get, do you do and process misdemeanor defendants on a regular basis as they're patting me down? 
uh, they went, they were dead silent. And of course, that's because we know the answer, Tucker. Yeah. How, this, how about, how about speak up, hit- son, I pay your salary. Like, how dare you treat me this yeah. way as an American <laughs> citizen? Seriously. Yeah. They didn't in, answer in the, your question. Yeah, in the hundred year, yeah, in the hundred year history of that agency, hundred plus year history of that, they never processed misdemeanor defendants of any kind, particularly nonviolent misdemeanor defendants. Uh, it's it, that's not what they do. I mean, every single FBI agent will tell you that when they joined the the uh, the agency, they were told that they were. They were on this uh, planet and in this country to go after the whales, not the tiny little minnows. But why don't they like quit? Me. That's what I don't understand. I mean, I, I've always respected law enforcement on principle and FBI agents, I guess, on principle. But if you're participating in a system that's just political tyranny, which is what it is, it's not a, it's not, there's nothing justice related about any of this. It's Joe Biden putting his critics behind bars. How can you live with yourself? Like, isn't at a certain point it their responsibility too? I, I've been analyzing that, <laughs> the answer to that question for quite some time now. And the only answer I have is that we're now into a generation of special agents and even special agents in charge that came in after the Patriot Act, that came in during the Obama administration, that came in after the politicization was overwhelming at the top in the leadership. And in fact, now the, you know, in most of the field offices, those in charge are, are political operatives by, by and large, Tucker. And so that's the answer. Now we'll tell you this, when I got to the courthouse, one of the uh, U.S. Marshals processing me down there, he actually looked at my paperwork and he said, point blank, this is bullshit. Yeah. And he's right. That's right. And good for him. Yeah. And I said, I, and, and, yeah. And then he said, and he said, and I will tell you what else is bullshit. He said, we process a lot of these. He said, you guys, you know, you J6ers. And he said, I think that uh, former President Trump should be paying for every one of your legal fees. Well, I agree with that, too. I, I do agree with that. Yeah. And I think it's. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you should be afraid to behave like this if you're an FBI agent. Um, I think you should be afraid of it. You, you can't act like that toward your fellow citizens and you can't be the instrument of political tyranny and get away with it. Um, mm-hmm. So did anyone, is there anyone to appeal to? So you, you work with Glenn Beck, who mm-hmm. is really taken up and good for him. He's a good man, your, your cause. Yeah. But did anyone with official power step in to try and help you? Uh, no one with official power. I mean, we've had quite a few people speak out on my behalf. Uh, we've had some congressmen speak out on my behalf. We've had uh, uh, current presidential uh, uh, nominee uh, or uh, nominee apparent, as well as those a uh, couple of others that were running, uh, Ramaswamy, uh, DeSantis. And then in addition to that, we've had a host of other friendly media. But as you can probably surmise, and as you obviously stated earlier, nobody from the mainstream media has come forward yet and said, hey, you know, we probably better stick up for this guy, even though he's not necessarily one of us because pendulum swing. Yeah, right. And more importantly, more importantly, Tucker, pend- whether the pendulum swings or not, if it continues to swing far into the tyrannical left, they purge themselves eventually if you've read a history book. They will yeah. take out the factions of the factions first. Yes. Well, but such a thing as principle exists. I mean, some things are just wrong because they're wrong. Racial discrimination, right. putting people in prison because you don't like their political views. These are just wrong. It doesn't matter who they're happening to. They're just they're just wrong uh, on their own terms. Um, did it ever did part of you think, well, maybe I just won't participate. You know, I've spent my whole life in this country, paid taxes, believed in the system. This is not justice. This is not the justice system. This is a tool of political repression. And maybe you just say, come and get me. I'm I'm not I'm not well that playing along. <laughs> yeah, well, for for two and a half years. Yeah. For two and a half years, I didn't have to set my alarm clock because every morning at six o'clock I would wake up because I've been following these cases. I've been following these trials. I've followed hundreds of these cases. There's over thirteen hundred and fifty of these arrests so far, uh, all manner of defendants for uh, January 6th. Most of them, of course, are nonviolent. And I've been following these cases. And believe it or not, Many, I mean, far, far too many to even uh, recount of the simple misdemeanor 
uh, defendants, including other independent journalists, have been SWAT raided at their home. Some of them have been imprisoned and did nothing more than walk around in the Capitol with a big camera rig, no pating, parading, no picketing, no chanting USA, USA, or anything else of the nature. And um, they, they did their job professionally. And when they got back home, they were SWAT raided by 20 agents with the uh, red dots on their chest and on their wife and on their children, and then hauled off, uh, uh, convicted, sent to prison for months. Independent journalists. It's beyond. It's, uh, so what happens next in your case? Uh, I have uh, in two days. I have a DC hearing. It's uh, it's one that I can do by Zoom. Uh, it's simply not much more than a repeat of what we did in Dallas because this was an out of district hearing. So now I've got to do it before a DC magistrate. So it's a magistrate. So it's just basically the same thing without the leg change this time. And then we start the process of our strategy uh, with my with my legal team to determine how we're going to proceed. And part of that process was learning who our judge was, and that's pretty interesting. I'm revealing that to you for the first time. Uh, judge Christopher Cooper is also the exact same judge who held uh, Catherine Herridge in contempt two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm very aware of that. It's unbelievable. Steve Baker, I appreciate your taking the time to update us on what has happened to you. Um, again, it's tyranny. I know you know that, um, but it's shocking to see it. Good luck. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you. Free speech is bigger than any one person or any one organization. Societies are defined by what they will not permit. What we're watching is the total inversion of virtue.